certain truths are inherently linked with what the Bible teaches about Christianity. We oftentimes talk about the first principles and the fundamentals and the basics. One of those fundamental truths is the final, complete, universal judgment of mankind on the basis of the divine standard on which, under which they lived on earth. And at that judgment, each person will be sentenced to either heaven or hell for eternity. Now let that sink in for a minute. It's not like anybody here, at least I think most, have never heard such a thing. But I don't think it ever hurts us to think seriously about that in so far as our faithfulness to God and the day of reckoning that is coming. Now the political correctness of our fundamentally secular world as well as many who claim to be Christians, decrees that any talk of such a judgment, any kind of accountability, any kind of condemnation for a life not lived like God says, is a repulsive thing. This educated, sophisticated people don't uh, think that way. They don't say things like that. It's sort of interesting to watch how the world works because they will say that if you're really educated and knowledgeable and know what's what, then you wouldn't think about such a thing as that. On the other hand, you'll see these billboards with somebody looking like he's a billionaire in a ritzy place, and uh, what are they advertising? He's holding a glass of old snort. So it's interesting what people do to say, oh, this kind of person never thinks of such reviling things. On the other hand, they're sure trying to get you drunk. So you can't trust the world. You can't trust the world. You can't even trust yourself beyond the teaching of the truth. You trust that, and you're always on safe ground. The same Bible teaches that heaven is a place for God's people and that hell is a place for all those who choose not to believe and obey the gospel. That's just as fundamental as it gets. We must remember that heaven then is a prepared place for a prepared people and the place of that preparation is here on this earth in the flesh when we're living here. But the same is also true for those who will be sentenced to hell. We prepare for hell as well as preparing for heaven. It's just what is entailed in that preparation. But whatever it is, it's all done in our lifetime in the flesh on this earth. Now, there's a time out there in the future somewhere when the world and all material things are going to be completely destroyed. Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 10, or verse, chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking to and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. You see, when the earth ends, there must be a place for all those who lived on it. And that's going to be heaven or hell. But there's something that takes place before people are consigned to either place. And that's, that's the separation of the wicked from the righteous. And this period for that great and eternal separation the Bible calls the day of judgment. Now one cannot have biblical faith in Jesus 
without believing what the Bible teaches about the day of judgment, the final judgment, the complete judgment of all people. Therefore, in this sermon, I want to study with you for a little while with about some of the Bible records or what the Bible records concerning this judgment day. We must realize this is not like watching Star Wars or Harry Potter or Fellowship of the Ring and Middle Earth. This is something that's going to happen. And you're going to be there and experience it even as I am. It's real. We'll be in attendance personally experiencing this judgment. Now notice, and this is how we'll study it. This judgment day, this final and complete judgment at the end of the world is certain. And that time at the end of the world when Christ returns is going to be without warning. It will include everyone living or dead. It will be executed by Jesus Christ himself. And it will be based upon God's standard. If you lived in the patriarchal age, that standard of conduct will be the standard whereby you will give account to God. If as a Jew you lived in the law of Moses was the way that God directed them, then you give an account of that. And since the establishment of the Lord's church, the New Testament, around 2,000 years, men will stand on that judgment day to give an account to God on the basis of what's taught in the New Testament. I say, first of all, that there will most certainly and assuredly be a day of final and complete, perfect judgment. Hebrews 9 and verse 27, the writer said, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that, the judgment. I don't know whether you give thought about this like you should, but when you think about death which we all must face if the Lord doesn't come back first, then I dare say any of the anxieties that might be there, and with many, a great deal of fear, comes not because of just the act of dying, although there's a mystery about that, but it's because the Scripture says, and after that, the judgment. But you must stand before God whether you lived here 20 years or 100 and give an account to Him of the deeds done in the body. If you look throughout the work of our Lord, that is, in His earthly ministry, you see that He taught many parables about the coming judgment. If you go to Luke chapter 12, and I'll just go through these rather hurriedly, in verse 36 He speaks of it as if a master is returning from a great feast. In verse 41 He speaks of the steward's judgment when the master returned after being gone a long, long time, a lengthy absence. In the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew, he speaks of the ten virgins in verse number 1. All of this he's using to teach about the judgment day. And in verse 14, he speaks of the talents. We remember that because of the one talent man. Now, why is he saying all this? Because it is a certain thing. It's coming. Some people say, well, there's one thing that you can't escape, and that's death and taxes. You better put a third one there. And that's the judgment. So the doctrine of the judgment is important. Jesus taught about it. Coming to the apostles of the Christ, they also did. Notice that the Apostle Paul taught it as a part of his evangelistic message. That ought to say something to those of us who are seeking to convert others by the proclamation of the gospel, by teaching people the truth. In Acts 24, in verse 25, as he stood before Felix, and as he, notice Paul, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, which means self-control, and judgment to come. This old pagan trembled. Felix trembled. And answered, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. That's always been a problem, hasn't it? One seeks a Savior only when one realizes 
that he's lost in some sense, that he actually needs somebody to save him. Now, when we speak of sin, we know sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. It's the only thing that can separate us from God. God being a perfectly just God, we must have some way of being forgiven and God remaining just. And, of course, he chose that one of the Godhead three should become man and do as a man what we couldn't do for ourselves. And thus, because he could go to the cross sinless, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, then he could die on our behalf. And he did, offering his body a sacrifice for sin, for it knew no sin, tempted in every point like as we are, but without sin, and shedding his blood for the remission of sins, to purchase the church. This is my blood of the New Testament. Every time you open your New Testament, you ought to think about that. That New Testament is here, and it's efficacious because of the blood that brought it into existence. So, Christ points out you can't save yourself. 1,500 years, the law said to the Jews, by a law system, a pure law system, you can't save yourself. Once you have sinned, there must be forgiveness, because pure justice says you deserve punishment. Christ carried all that punishment on his own shoulders on the cross. Read Isaiah 53 and see that. With his stripes, we are healed. And thus, we through faith by the gospel system, the power of God to save us, Romans 1.16, are able to enjoy all that Christ did for us we couldn't do for ourselves when we in faith obey him and live faithful in the church. The Hebrews writer lists the doctrine of eternal judgment as one of the first principles of the gospel of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Interesting to note that those things are said to be foundational, first principle, basic, fundamental. And Paul's saying those ought to be well in hand when you become a Christian. And building upon those, you go to deeper knowledge and understanding of righteousness and godliness. So all people must be informed and warned about the judgment, and we Christians need to be regularly reminded of it, lest we faint and fall by the wayside. So we need to know that when we're teaching others about becoming a Christian, that the matter of the resurrection of the dead and the judgment is right in there with the plan of salvation and the church. It's essential that these things be taught. The judgment will come without warning. I don't know about you, but serious matters like to be warned about. But the judgment is coming without warning. Well, in what sense? Well, not in the sense the Bible doesn't tell us that there's going to be one and tell us how to prepare for it. It's just that you don't know the day or the hour in which it's going to come. We learn that God has, though, in His mind, appointed a certain day for men to be judged. We think of Galatians 4.4 4 and say in the fullness of time God sent forth His Son. Well, that was to come to earth, be a man, do the things necessary to save us. But then you can also think the same way and you don't do any violence of the Scriptures at all to realize that in the fullness of time there's a certain day out there that in the mind of God He knows it's the time for the final judgment. Paul in preaching to people on Mars Hill in Athens in Acts 17, 30 and 31 said, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now there's a reason for that, and he gives a because right here. Because he hath appointed a day. It's already in the mind of God. He's appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Deity will judge this world through Jesus Christ. The judgment is going to come 
when no man's expecting it because things are going to continue on even as they are now in routine activity. In 1 Thessalonians 2 or 5 verses 2 and 3, he says to the church there, For ye yourselves, or for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when ye shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. How is that? Well, he gives a good example of it. As travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Those who've had babies, women know this very well. They know how quickly those pains can start. And that's the way it's going to be when the Lord comes back. If he were to come back today, we'd be doing just what we're doing right now. Not anything any different. Comes back on Saturday, whatever you normally do on Saturday, that's what it's going to be when he comes, or on Monday, or Wednesday, or at night, whenever. Because you see, if he comes at night for us, it'll be daytime somewhere else. The judgment will include everyone living at the time the Lord comes at the end of the world or those who have already lived and gone on into eternity and are in the Hadean world such as we find in Luke 16 with the rich man and Lazarus. Believers and non-believers alike at that time will bow to the judge of all the earth and confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And every person will be personally and individually judged. Romans 14, latter part of verse 10 through 12. Uh, it's interesting how well we can be burdened down with the, the affairs of how things work now. Somebody says, well, everybody that's always lived, all the way up to the point, well, that may be still a thousand years in our future, or five thousand years. And, and that's going to be a long day. <laughs> but folks, the whole thing changes when you step out of time and material things into that eternal day. There won't be any concept or reckoning of things as we reckon them here. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 14. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Then he says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So even those, as I said a moment ago, who have died will be judged. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, in Philippians 2, 9 and 10, Wherefore God also, speaking of Christ, hath highly exalted Him, and given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth. I often, in reading what atheists say and watching debates uh, such as they are on YouTube with atheists, and I hear them say all manner of things. And I, I, I shudder almost on their behalf for what they do not grasp and will not believe that lies ahead for them. The spirit beings will also be judged, not just mankind, in other words, all of God's creation. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2, specifically verse 4, For God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them unto chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment. Jesus is going to call the dead out of their graves, as we would picture it in the resurrection. And they're coming out of their graves, or they're resurrected to be judged. Peter, by inspiration, also wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, 4 and 5, Speaking of those who warred against the church and who opposed Christians and persecuted them, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, Speaking evil of you. You know, things haven't changed. When you're truly, by the gospel, converted to Christ, you come out of the world, living like the world on the basis of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. People who still love that way of life and knew you used to go with them in those things, they, they're either going to be influenced for good in you by the example you set and want to be 
a Christian eventually, or as most do, they turn against you. And this is what happened in the first century. But he says of them, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick, meaning the, those that are alive and the dead, those who are separated. In John 5, 25 through 29, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also. Because He is the Son of Man. Now let me pause there and emphasize this. Christ is as much man as you are. But as deity in the flesh, deity and man, living on this earth as man, tempted to every point like as we are yet without sin, but being God, He knows all there is being God. He knows all there is being man. Then He's the rightful judge. Deity is committed judgment then to the God-man because He is the Son of Man. He's been here and done that and experienced this. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Sometimes if you want to contemplate these passages and others like them, Go take your Bible to the cemetery. It's a quiet place. There won't be anybody bothering you. And sit there and read it. And as you read, you look at every tombstone. Remember, that person lived and moved and had his being, enjoyments, and happiness, and hard times, just like you. And as far as what they have materially, it's right there in that little grave. And not even all of that. It's only part of that. But every one of those people will move just like we are. Jesus is going to judge. But now, He's seeking to save us. That we'll be prepared for that judgment. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Lost how? Lost in sin. What does that mean? Guilty of sin, separated from God. He came to save us from that condemned state. Jesus reigns as the sovereign of the universe. He declared himself that the Father had committed all authority into him in heaven and on earth in Matthew 28, 18. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14 and verse 6. In Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, the Apostle Paul wrote concerning these matters to the church in Ephesus, writing which he wrought in Christ, meaning the way of salvation in all things are involved with Christ as the executor of the Father's will, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under His feet, and gave him to be head over, over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. When we think that people on earth have a lot of power, and among men, certainly many have far more power than others. Go back and read passages like this. And that's your Savior. That's your Lord and Master. That's the head of the church. That's the one who gave his life a ransom for many. And he's on your side. What shall man do unto us? The Father has appointed the Son, Jesus, to be the judge of all the world. John 5, 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but, the, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Remember Acts 17, 31, He's appointed Jesus to be the judge of the world. In 2 Timothy 4, 1, as Paul is charging Timothy to preach the word. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. You see how much judgment is said in the gospel message? How much Jesus is saying, if you're going to be a Christian, you're getting prepared to face Jesus at the judgment. Only Jesus can set the standard for judgment. 
Now, men have set all kinds of standards through the years, and we're seeing what a mess they've made of it in moral and spiritual matters as far as what they consider to be the standard of right and wrong. Some have been good as the Bible defines the good. Many more have been evil as the Bible defines evil. It's a commonplace thing, and nobody raises eyebrows to the murdering of unborn babies today. It's only a matter of time, and it may be being done in secret now for people at the end of their years because of the status of a lot of folks physically as to hasting the elderly's death. And they don't call that evil, but God does. One can be highly esteemed among men, but absolutely detestable to God. In Luke 16 and verse 15, and he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. And that's what most men are busy doing. You ever notice that? Ye are they which justify themselves before men. But listen, but God knoweth your hearts. Then he said, but that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And without a proper knowledge and an honest approach to that knowledge found in the Bible, most men will seek to justify themselves before other men. God has a law under which all men will be judged. And you may be thinking a little differently in view of what we said, but it's this law. It is the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. What is that law? When you sin, you die. When you transgress God's law, you are immediately separated from God. Well, once that happens, you're guilty. Yeah, buts won't work. You're guilty. Well, if you're guilty, you deserve condemnation. Well, only in Christ, notice in Christ, can one be free from the law of sin and death. That's why the gospel is God's power to say the glad tidings of the Christ. And that's why they're glad tidings or good news. Happy information. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul reminds the Corinthians of what he preached to them when he came to them. And we understand the facts and the promises and so forth pertaining to the gospel. One must choose to be under that system of favor or grace. That's the New Testament system. That's the gospel system. He must choose it in the flesh, in this life. Thus, he must choose before the judgment day. When a person dies, all opportunities to change has ceased. There may be a great deal of sorrow for ungodly lives lived, and I don't doubt what there is. That's what makes punishment more so in torment is to know you could have done this, could have done that. You had this one there to help you. You had this being said. You had this being preached. You had this Bible study. You had this good example. But you just went ahead and lived like the rest of the world. Now that's going to haunt you without end. Jesus has made the standard known in advance of that judgment day. We've well, all heard quoted, and I probably quoted as much as I have any verse in my sermons here anywhere I've preached. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. There is no excuse for not knowing what the standard of judgment will be then. And thus that ought to motivate us, even as the elements melting with fervent heat should causing us to live closer to God, spend more time with the study of the Bible, more time in honest reflection on our lives in the light of what God says is righteousness in this world. Ignorance of the law is not acceptable. It won't work with God. Somebody may say, well, I just didn't know. Well, what do you think life of the flesh was all about? Number one, to find God. That's why Paul said this sermon on Mars Hill, he's not far from all of us. It's just that most people don't want to find him. And when you don't want to find him, you're not going to find him. So what is life in the flesh all about? Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is life in the flesh all about? Fear God and keep his commandments, this whole duty of God, of man. 
uh, what then must that mean? It must mean that I must use life to find God. And God revealed himself all over the place in every way. And in his special revelation, he tells us exactly about sin, who's lost, and how God loves us, and how to be saved. The judgment is going to be completely just. Because the judge is just. The standard is just. God is, is consistent. Thus, Jesus, the God-man, is consistent. Always consistent. Sometimes we'll say, Oh, consistency, thou art a jewel. And it is. No man can always, on all occasions, be consistent. Now, that's the goal. That's the desire. But because we're human, sometimes we flounder, or we haven't thought a thing through well enough to know when we're being inconsistent, or we're too blinded by our wives or our husbands or our parents or our children or our friends or by the job we sure need in this terrible economic situation. We can't do that. Jesus is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is a totally impartial judge. 1 Peter 1.17 reads, speaking to Christians, And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. That means with reverence toward God for what He is, and that He's not a man. The basis of judgment, now get this, will be 100% factual and there won't be any emotions changing any of it. Now let's see, if that's the way it's going to be at the judgment, how should I view things now in the light of that divine truth that will be the standard at the judgment? Well, that's my child. You can't expect much out of them as you do your child. Hey, everybody's somebody's child. I don't think anybody's been made from the dust of the ground or a rib. You came here by procreation. Mama and Daddy, they may not have been all they ought to have been, but bringing you into the world, they gave you a chance to go to heaven. So God's not influenced by bribes. Deuteronomy 10, 17 says under the old law, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty God. And a terrible, listen, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He is without prejudice. He is completely without partiality. In Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45, Jesus said to the Jews, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth the rain on the just and on the unjust. I pause here for a minute to say this much. In this world, even the evil get great blessings from God. But when they are assigned to hell at the judgment, there is the total withdrawal of all things godly from hell. That's where they chose to be by their constant rebellion to God and rejection of God, Christ, and the gospel system. And God says, I've prepared a place to reward you for what you labored for. And there will be no influence in a godly way, is prepared for those who don't want to be with God. Cultural values, when it comes down to what's right and what's wrong, to who's a Christian, who's not, make any difference. We must understand that we are to obey God's will no matter what. Now, God's will addresses matters under cultural things. That's true. But never are we to submit to traditions and cultural matters or social things when those things in themselves cause us to violate God's law. 
we always abide by them and submit to them when they are complimentary and supported of the truth because it's the truth that makes us free. John 8, 32. Jesus is not from this world. Hey, that means he has no cultural bias. In John 8, 23, and he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. That tells me more and more why I should spend time with the revelation of the mind of the one that's not of this world so that I'll know how to live in this world above this world and not tainted by this world. He commands his followers not to even be attached to this world. 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things in the world. The judgment will be a, a time of sentencing. It's not going to be the time of the trial. That's going on right now. There's not going to be any courtroom scene. All of the facts are in at the day of judgment. The verdict has been made. And the day of judgment is simply the sentencing of all men. There will be no plea bargains. There won't be any kind of deals made. There will be no evidence presented or arguments made. That's going on right now. Get that out of your head. That's not the judgment day. Think of judgment day like the Bible says. A meeting out of sentence. That's how the good are separated from the evil. All the facts are clearly understood. And all the motives cannot be disputed. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Of course, he wrote that to the church, didn't he? Because every man will not have praise of God if every man is outside of Christ or unfaithful when he dies. So this was meant to be comforting to those who are Christians. God will take care of it all is what he's saying. That's why I'm glad to know that vengeance is His. He will repay. But woe be to those people He repays in vengeance. Because He knows exactly what's needed. Each person will individually give an account for every act done while on earth. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to who he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Matthew 12, 36 and 37, Jesus speaking, But I say unto you, that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. No wonder Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. No wonder we are taught, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Colossians 3 and verse 17. Brethren, you better be in the Lord. You better be faithful in Christ, where the blood cleanses, so He can present you holy. And pure as if you had never sinned. What is our conclusion? Well, let's go back over what we said in the beginning. The judgment day is certain. It's going to come without warning. It's going to include everyone, whether they're living or dead. It'll be executed solely by Jesus Christ. It'll be based upon God's standard that men lived under. It'll be totally and completely just. And it's not going to be a trial situation. It'll be a day of sentencing on the basis of what the jury declared when you died or the Lord came back. It's going to be a, a day of great sorrow for many. Hebrews 10, 30 and 31. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 2 Thessalonians 1, latter part of 7 through verse 9. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are going to pay a penalty that never ends, for that's the heinousness and significance and power of sin. When you transgress and die unforgiven, there is punishment forevermore. Nahum, in Nahum 1 verse 3, 
reads, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not acquit the wicked. The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of His feet. All who have sinned will be punished for every sin they've committed. That punishment is eternal separation from God, Romans 6, 30, 23. Now we know all of us sin, Romans 3, verse 23. He said in verse 10 of Romans 3, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Those who are in Christ, thank God, are freed from the sentence of eternal death. That's why you have in Revelation 2, 10, Be thou faithful even if it crossed your life. That's the significance unto death. And you'll receive the crown of life. Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 2. In Romans 5, 4, we see that sin is not reckoned or imputed unto those who are faithful under the gospel system. Righteousness then is reckoned or imputed to the child of God, the faithful Christian. And it's because of his faithful obedience. James 2.23 Faith without works is dead being alone. So faith that is obedient is a living, active, and saving faith. The Christian stands in the judgment without fear. Anticipating his eternal reward. 1 John 4, 17 and 18, the great apostle wrote, Herein is our love made perfect. Now listen to him. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Well, why is that, John? Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love for perfect. That's complete love. It's in Love is seen in obedience to the truth. If you love me, keep my commandments. Complete love is an obedient love, just like a living faith is an obedient faith. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Jude 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's the gospel and the power of it to those who love the Lord and will render obedience to it. We rejoice in those seeding great and precious promises. Now, are you a Christian today? If not, there's no hope for you. If you die now, you'll lift up your eyes being in torment and you must face Christ on the day of judgment as one died in your sins and receive the sentence, Depart from me, I never knew you into everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. As a child of God, if you will be faithful, determined to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I hope this sermon certainly points that out. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. You can look forward to the day to hear fall from the blessed lips of our Savior. You stand before Him. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Now everybody here is going to hear one of those. It's going to be assigned to you as your sentence. If you will humble yourself and obey the gospel and live faithful, you hear well done. If you don't obey him or if you obey and fall away, you'll hear depart from me. Be honest with yourself. As God searches your heart, his prayers are sinned on your behalf. As the judgment day grows closer. We ask you to come to Jesus if you need while we stand and sing.